Well, I think, I think the relations between Washington and Beijing have more to do with Beijing than they do with the United States. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's the case that the nations of East and Southeast Asia in particular, and South Asia, are the ones that are most worried uh, about a region that is dominated by China without a countervailing uh, influence from, uh, from outside. Um, the, the, the choice, the direction that China takes uh, over the next 50 years is largely China's. I think America or anybody else's uh, ability to influence it is uh, small. But what I think we need to be thinking about is the alternative scenarios of China's development. Right now, uh, I think it's true in Europe and the United States that people uh, see what they call China's peaceful rise, uh, becoming a responsible stakeholder in world affairs. And it's essentially based on a projection of Chinese economic growth uh, from the, over the last 20 years. Now, uh, that's a very optimistic scenario. Uh, it'd be uh, nice if it worked out that way. But I don't necessarily buy China's economic statistics. Uh, I think there's a lot of air in them, number one. Number two, I think they've got a lot of enormous social problems. Uh, last year, for the first time, their workforce declined only by a few million people, but it wasn't going up. Their population is aging. Uh, the one child per family policy sustained now over several decades has had a significant effect. Uh, and because of gender-specific abortion decisions uh, uh, in China favoring boy babies over girl babies, there are estimates that uh, they're, they're in, the, in, the, in the current uh, Chinese population, uh, there are perhaps 30 to 40 million marriage-age men who have no prospect of getting married. Now, if you don't think that's not a force for social instability, I'd like to talk to you after this is over. The, these are problems that China has no answer for at the moment, number one. Number two, the scenario that simply projects forward uh, the economic growth of the past several decades ignores uh, a lot of the uh, complexity in Chinese society that's not well understood outside. This is a 7,000-year-old culture. So rather than taking the last 20 years, let's take the last 100 years. And what have we seen in China in the last 100 years? the fall of the last imperial dynasty, the first establishment of the Republic of China, the first collapse of the Republic of China, the warlord period, the period of the Japanese invasion, uh, the civil war between Chinese communists and Chinese nationalists, the defeat of Japan, the second establishment of the Republic of China, the second fall of the Republic of China, the establishment of the People's Republic. Uh, in the 1950s, the Great Leap Forward, the single most mortal human decision ever made. More people died of hunger in the 1950s in China than in any other, uh, caused by any other human decision. Followed by the great proletarian cultural revolution of the 60s that destroyed uh, untold amounts of Chinese history and culture. Followed by the massacre at Tiananmen Square then followed by 20 years of economic growth. So if you want to take a century and project that forward rather than the last 20 years, you've got a potentially very different scenario, especially when you consider that the People's Liberation Army uh, remains the most important political component within the Communist Party, and the Communist Party remains dominant in uh, Chinese uh, political life. So there are a wide variety of scenarios, and Rosie's scenario number one is possible, but not certain and may not be likely. But what decision the Chinese make is going to be theirs. It's not going to be ours.